So the idea is that there's an underlying structure that's got this quasi-patriarchal nature, partly because it's for complex reasons, but partly because it's a reflection of the social structure as well as other things, and then that uses consciousness in the form particularly of language, but most particularly in the form of truthful language in order to produce the world in a manner that's good. And I think that's a walloping, powerful, powerful idea, especially the relationship between the idea that it's truthful speech that gives rise to the good, because that's a really fundamental moral claim. And I think that's a tough one to beat, man, because one of the things I've really noticed is, and, and this and it isn't just me, that's for sure, is that you know, there's a lot of tragedy in life. There's no doubt about that. And lots of people that I see, for example, in my clinical practice are laid low by the tragedy of life. But I also see very, very frequently that people get tangled up in deceit, in webs of deceit that are often multiple generations long. And that just takes them out. You know, and so, the, so deceit can produce extraordinary levels of suffering that, that last for very, very long periods of time. And that's really a clinical truism, you know, because Freud, of course, identified one of the problems that contributed to the suffering we might associate with mental illness with repression, which is kind of like a lie of omission. That's a perfectly reasonable way to think about it. And Jung stated straight out that there was no difference between the psychotherapeutic, the curative psychotherapeutic effort and supreme moral effort, including truth. That, those were the same thing as far as he was concerned. And Carl Rogers, another great clinician who was at one point a Christian missionary before he became um, more, more, more strictly scientific, he believed that it was in truthful dialogue that, that, that uh, clinical transformation took place. And, you know, it, 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 and of course, one of the prerequisites for genuine transformation in the clinical setting is that the therapist tells the truth and the client tells the truth because otherwise how in the world do you know what's going on? How can you solve a problem when you don't even know what the problem is? And you don't know what the problem is unless the person tells you the truth. That's something really to think about in light of your own relationships because you know, if you don't tell the people around you the truth then they don't know who you are. And maybe that's a good thing, you know, because, well, seriously, people have reasons to lie, right? I mean, that aren't trivial. But it's really worth knowing that you can't even get your hands on the problem unless you formulate it truthfully. And if you can't get your hands on the problem, the probability that you're going to solve it is just, just so low. And so then I've been thinking about, as well, the, this, this, and, and this idea has become more credible to me the, the longer I've developed it, the, the, the longer I've thought about it. You know, the idea that there's, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. It's partly the idea that, well, let me, let me figure out how to start this properly. Friend of mine, business partner, and a guy that I've written scientific papers with, very smart guy, took me to task, and I think I told you this a little bit, about using the term dominance hierarchy, which might be fine for like chimpanzees and for lobsters and, and, and for creatures <laughs> like that, but not, not, for, not, not for chimpanzees even so much. And, and he said something very interesting. He thought that the idea of dominance hierarchy was actually a projection of a early 20th century quasi-Marxist hypothesis onto the animal kingdom that was being observed. And the notion that the hierarchical structure that you see that characterizes, say, mating hierarchies in, in chimps, for example, the idea that that was predicated on power was actually a projection of a kind of political ideology. And I thought, that really bugged me for a long time when he said that. Because, <laughs> like, because I'd really been used to using the term dominance hierarchy. And I thought, he, he told me all that. I thought, ugh, that's so annoying. It's so <laughs> annoying. Because it might be right. And, and it took me months to think about it. And then, I, and then I was also reading Franz de Waal at the same time. And he's a primatologist. And also Jack Panksepp, who's, who's a brilliant, brilliant affective neuroscientist who unfortunately just died. He wrote a great book called Affective Neuroscience. And for rats to play, they have to play fair or they won't play with each other. And that's, that's a staggering discovery, right? Because anything that helps um, instantiate the, uh, the emergence of ethical behavior in animals and that associates it with an evolutionary process, which is essentially what, what, what Panksepp was doing, gives credence to the notion that the ethics that guide us are not mere sociological epiphenomenal constructs. They're deep, deeply rooted. If rats, and they're rats for God's sake, you can't trust them, and they still play fair, you know. And DeWall noticed that the chimp troops that he studied, 
like the, it, wasn't, it wasn't the barbar barbaric chimp that ruled with an iron fist that was the successful ruler because he kept getting torn to shreds by, his, by the compatriots that he ignored and stomped on. As soon as he showed some weakness, they'd just tear him into pieces. The chimp leaders that were stable, you know, that had a stable kingdom, let's say, were very reciprocal in terms of their interactions with their friends. And chimps have friends, and they, ask, they actually last for a very long time, chimp friendships. And they were also very... Um, reciprocal in their inter interactions with the females and with the infants. And I, I thought, that's a, that's a, Franz de Waal is a very smart guy. And I thought that was also foundational science because it's really something to note that the attributes that give rise to dominance in a male dominance hierarchy, sorry to use that word, let's call it authority, that might be better, or even shudder competence, which I think is a better way of thinking about it, is that that's not predicated purely on anything that's, that's, that's as simple as brute power. And I think too, you know, I think as well that the idea, and this is a deeply devious and dangerous political idea in my estimation, the idea that male dominance hierarchies, sorry, male hierarchies are fundamentally predicated on power in a, in a law-abiding law society, I think is, I think all you have to do is think about that for like a month, say, <laughs> which isn't that long, to understand how absurd that is. Because most people who are in positions of authority, let's say, are just as hemmed in by ethical responsibility, or even more so, than people at the other levels of the, of the hierarchy. And we know this even in the managerial literature, because we know, generally speaking, that managers are more stressed by their subordinates than the subordinates are stressed by their managers. And that's not surprising. You, know, you want to be responsible for like 200 people? You really want that? That's hard work, man. And I mean, I know it's a pain to have a boss because you have to care about what the boss thinks. And maybe the person is arbitrary, in which case they're not going to be particularly successful. But it's no joke to be responsible for 200 people. And you have to behave very carefully when you're in a position of responsibility and authority like that because you will get called out if you make mistakes constantly. So it's not like you're, it's not like because you have a position that's higher up in the hierarchy that you're less constrained by ethical necessity. Now, if you're a psychopath, well, that's a whole different story, but psychopaths have to move pretty rapidly from hierarchy to hierarchy, right? Because they get found out quite quickly. And as soon as their reputation is shattered, then they can't get away with their shenanigans anymore. So, okay, so all of this is to say that there is something very interesting about the pattern of behavior. So imagine that Imagine that sexual selection is working something like this, and, and, and we know that sexual selection is a very, 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 very powerful biological force, even though biologists ignored it for almost 100 years after Charles Darwin originally wrote about it, thinking mostly about natural selection. They didn't like the idea of sexual selection because it tended to introduce the notion of mind into the process of evolution because it, it deals with choice. You know? but, so imagine, on the one hand, that you have a male hierarchy, we know that the men at the top of the hierarchy are much more likely to be reproductively successful than the men at the bottom. That's particularly true of men. So you have twice as many female ancestors as you have male ancestors. I'm not going to do the math, but, and I know it doesn't sound plausible, but it, you could look it up and figure it out. And it's it's a perfectly reasonable fact that it actually happens to be true. So there's twice as, you have twice as many female ancestors because females are twice as likely, on average, to leave offspring as men. Now what happens is, any man, man who does reproduce tends to reproduce more than once, but a bunch of them reproduce zero. Whereas, so it would be the average man who reproduces has two children, and the average man who doesn't reproduce has zero, obviously, and the average woman who reproduces has one child. So that means that there's twice as many females in your line as there is males. So that, that's a big deal. And, and so imagine that it works something like this. So the men elect the, the, the competent men who are, are admired and who are, and who are uh, I can't say dominant, who are, who are given positions of authority and respect. Let's put it that way. And it's like an election. Now, it could be an actual democratic election, but it's at least an election of consensus, or it's at least an election of, well, we're not going to kill him for now, which is also a form of election, right? It's a form of tolerance, you know? So, so, and then what happens is the women, for their part, peel from the top of the male hierarchy. And so you've got two factors that are driving human sexual selection across vast stretches of evolutionary time. One is the election of men by men to positions where they're much more likely to reproduce. And the second is the tendency of women to peel off the top of male dominance hierarchies, which is extraordinarily well established cross-culturally. Even if you flatten out the socioeconomic 
uh, disparity, say, between men and women, like they've done in Scandinavia, you don't, you don't uh, uh, reduce the tendency of women to peel off the top of the male hierarchy by much. And why, why would you? I mean, women are smart. Why in the world wouldn't they go for, for, why wouldn't they strive to make relationships with men who are relatively successful? And why wouldn't they let the men themselves define why that, how that constitutes success? It makes sense. Like, if you want to figure out who the best man is, why not let the men compete and let the, ma the man who wins, whatever the competition is, is the best man by definition? How else would you define it? So, okay, so why am I telling you all that? Well, the reason is, is because it seems to me that there's, this comp there's been this complex interplay across human evolution between the election of the male dominance hierarchy and sexual success. And that's a big deal if it's true. It could be, because what would happen, you see, is that as men evolved, they would evolve to be better and better at climbing up the male hierarchy. Because the ones who weren't good at that wouldn't reproduce. So obviously that's going to happen. But then it wouldn't just be a hierarchy, because there's a whole bunch of different hierarchies. And so then you might say, well, are there commonalities across hierarchies? That's a reasonable thing to propose. It, I mean, they're not completely opposed to one another, at least. If you're more success, relatively more successful in one hierarchy, then you're more probable, it's more probable that you'll be successful in another. And that's actually a really good definition of general intelligence, or IQ. And that's actually one of the things that women select men for. Now, men also select women for that, but the selection pressure is even higher from women to men. And general IQ is one of the things that propels you up across dominance hierarchies because it's a general problem-solving mechanism. And the other thing that seems to do that to some degree is conscientiousness. And there's also some evidence that women prefer conscientious men. So, and, and of course, why wouldn't they? Because you can trust them and, 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 and they work. And so those are both good things. So then you think, okay, so men have adapted to start to climb the male dominance hierarchy, but it's the set of all possible hierarchies that they're adapted to climb. And so then you think there's, there's a set of attributes that can be acted out that, and that can be embodied that will increase the probability that you're going to rise to the top of any given hierarchy. And then you could say, well, that as you adapt to that fact, then you start to develop an understanding of what that pattern constitutes. And so that starts to become the abstract representation of something like multidimensional competence. And that's like the abstraction of virtue itself. Well, and none of that has, then none of that's arbitrary, man. That's as bloody well grounded in biology as anything could be. And I think that's a really hard argument to refute.